Welcome back, horror fans, cinephiles, and giallo enthusiasts. This is Tanner Leeser, your host for The King in Giallo. This is episode 7 of the Forgotten Giallo film series, 1968, part 1. And I've got two gialli I'd like to highlight. As always, thanks in no small part to Troy Howard's book on giallo cinema, So Deadly, So Perverse, 50 Years of Italian Giallo Films, Volume 1, 1963-1973. Like this video and subscribe to The King in Giallo, and do ring that notification bell so those lords of the algorithm may bestow their blessing upon me and you continue to be presented with weekly giallo content. This all helps me build my brand here as I fight to get to 1,000 subscribers and get one step closer to monetization here on YouTube. On to the video. The first film for 1968 is A Black Veil for Lisa, an Italian and West German production. It is directed by Massimo Dallamano and written by Giuseppe Belli, Massimo Dallamano, and Vittorio Petrilli. The original music is by Gianfranco Reverberi, with the music for the U.S. re-edit by Richard Markowitz. The cast includes John Mills as Inspector Franz Boulan, Luciana Paluzzi as Lisa, Robert Hoffman as Max Lint, Renate Cachet as Mariana, and Tullio Altamira as Ostermeyer. The plot of the film is about Inspector Boulan trying to solve a run of murders involving a switchblade, while trying to keep his marriage afloat. As lead after lead ends in disappointment, the strain of the investigation causes Boulan to feel a strong sense of jealousy towards his much younger wife, Lisa. Boulan finally finds a suspect, Max, but as ludicrous as it sounds, Instead of questioning the man, he recruits him instead to help him resolve his own domestic problems. This film was the first giallo from Massimo Dallamano, a cinematographer turned director, and is not as well regarded as his later forays within the genre, films such as What Have You Done to Solange, 1972, and What Have They Done to Our Daughters, 1974. Set in Hamburg, Germany, the thriller has a great plot and is reinforced by terrific performances from its main cast. With the help of cinematographer Angelo Lotti, who would go on to photograph Just Franco's Venus in Furs, 1969, Dallamano manages to beautifully capture all the grandeur and appeal of the historic German city. The film establishes a common theme of Dallamano's Jali films, steeping the mystery in psychosexual neuroses. The lead is similarly portrayed as the lead in the later giallo flick, So Sweet, So Dead, 1972, where despite the audience spending the majority of screen time with him and seeing things through his eyes, we aren't nudged to absolutely take his side in how he perceives things. In this film, Boulan's demanding job means he has been neglecting his wife at home, which leads him to assume the worst of their relationship and lose faith in her, which itself is enough to push many women away from their husbands even more than Boulan's initial career devotions. We don't see what Lisa is up to for the majority of the film, but we are not set against her. The film, rather than taking sides, just shows things as they are, just from Boulan's perspective as it is. Both films follow a lead who is more than willing to pervert the laws of justice in order to administer their own form of justice on a perceived unfaithful spouse. But whereas the later film takes the side of the husband, A Black Veil for Lisa does not take a side, but shows that Boulan's actions are unjust. The film is filled to the brim with great performances, coupled with mature characterization and a compelling atmosphere, never mind that the gore takes a back seat. Dallamano would prove to be an exploitation director more focused on delivering substance to his viewers than sleaze. Upon international releases, however, the film would be severely cut and lose a lot of what made it stand so well on its own two feet. Ten minutes were left on the cutting room floor between the original and the US cut. The original score, which kept the pace moving forward, was replaced with a new score, which slowed it down. Goes to show how important what you are hearing is in storytelling. There are some changes in the US cut which preserve some of the surprises, but by the finale, the edge is dulled, and the US edit seemingly misinterprets what the ending was supposed to convey. The production of the film overall holds up, and Dallamano proves that in his earliest executions in the giallo genre, that he always delivers with both story and 
imagery. This is perhaps the one forgotten giallo film you should see if you haven't. Massimo Dallamano was born in 1917 and entered into films as a cinematographer in the 1940s and eventually went on to achieve the massive success of working with Sergio Leone on the first two films of the Dollars trilogy, A Fistful of Dollars 1964 and For a Few Dollars More 1965. No surprise that his first film as a director was a spaghetti western, Bandidos 1967. Dalamano proved to be as capable of a cinematographer as a director, much like the grandfather of Italian horror, Mario Bava, but sadly he would pass away at the age of 59 in a car crash in 1976. John Mills heads the cast as the German police inspector, Boulogne. Mills invests fully in the role, whereas it was common for his contemporaries to take the paycheck and then cash in their performances. Born in 1908, Mills began his career in show business as a vaudeville dancer, then debuted in films in 1932. He moved up the ladder and eventually appeared in popular films of the time such as Goodbye Mr. Chips, 1939, and in Which We Serve, 1942, directed by Noel Coward and David Lean. He did a few films with Lean, including Great Expectations, 1946, and Ryan's Daughter, 1970, where he won an Oscar. He was knighted in 1976 and acted well into his 90s. He died at the age of 97 in 2005. Luciana Paluzzi plays Lisa, who was already a bombshell in the 1960s. She was born in 1937 and began in films in the early 1950s. Beyond her great looks, she was also a gifted and talented actor. Other film credits of hers include Return to Peyton Place, 1961, in which she starred with her husband at the time, Brett Halsey. Thunderball, 1965, where she netted her greatest and most lasting success as playing the femme fatale Fiona in this James Bond classic. She acted in One More Giallo, Without Trace, 1975, also called Calling All Cars, before retiring from acting in 1978. Robert Hoffman, an Austrian actor, plays Franz. He was born in 1939 and got his big break in acting by playing the lead in The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. 1964-65, to 65, which was a French West German production. His film credits include Grand Slam 1967 by Giuliano Montaldo, and his other giallo film credits are Death Carries a Cane 1973 and Spasmo 1974. Fun fact for the giallo enthusiasts, this appears to be the first giallo film where the shameless plugs for J&B Scotch began. The company has been around since the mid-1700s and has come to be a associated by some cinephiles with its presence in many Euro cult films, including Gialli, Poliziateschi, and sex comedies prevalent in the 1960s and 70s. The green bottle with the yellow label would become a staple in giallo cinema and is the J in the A to Z giallo film cliches, which this channel uses when tallying cliches in the Gialli tally. The next film of 1968 and the final one for this video is Deadly Inheritance, directed by Vittorio Sindoni, written by Aldo Bruno, Vittorio Sindoni, and Romano Migliorini, and music by Stefano Torossi. The cast is Tom Drake as Inspector Greville, Femi Benussi as Simone, Virgilio Gazzolo as Etienne, Ernesto Colli as Jeannot, and Ivo Garani as Ivan. The plot begins when old man Oscar dies in a freak accident and all his heirs gather together to find out who will inherit the sum of his money. The old man's will states that they will all collect equal portions given they wait until Jeannot reaches the legal age for him to collect. Jeannot is mentally handicapped and the intention from Oscar was that Jeannot would be taken care of by the others. But this all falls apart after Jeannot also dies soon after under gruesome circumstances. Inspector Greville arrives on the scene to find who is responsible for the bloodshed. The film is one of the first giallo films to employ the rural setting cliché, something utilized later in the genre as the films pushed away from the tourist traps of Italy, 
Germany, France, and England, and settled on exploiting the out-of-the-way locales, the zenith of which are probably Don't Torture a Duckling, 1972 by Lucio Fulci, and The House with the Laughing Windows, 1976 by Pupi Avati. The exploits of the rural setting and the difficulties they add in the storytelling are not fully put on display here in this first foray, but regardless, it adds a level of interest that all the Jalo films before were lacking. The film is under 90 minutes, but the pacing sadly drags out. Sindoni does not appear to have the affinity for the genre, but he manages to showcase a morbidly mutilated corpse ravaged from a collision with a train. The film is rightfully forgotten as it doesn't add much to what fans of the genre come to expect. The thrilling scenes are few, the sleaze is in short supply, the lighting is there just to do the bare minimum, and in the night scenes perhaps too much, the music is lackluster, and the surprises are predictable. Vittorio Sindoni was born in 1935 and began as an assistant director before transitioning to a writer and director. Here is his debut film. His other works are credited as being as unremarkable as Deadly Inheritance, and his later work in TV movies and miniseries is the same consensus. Tom Drake is the American actor leading the film, born in 1918. Drake appeared alongside Judy Garland in Vincente Minnelli's Meet Me in St. Louis, 1944. His 1950s run was facilitating between TV and B-movies, like The Cyclops, 1957, by Bert I. Gordon. The 1960s saw him in a few international productions, and his career eventually saw him return to America, where he had some guest appearances in The Night Stalker and The Streets of San Francisco. Femi Benussi was born in 1945 and debuted in Massimo Popilio's The Bloody Pit of Horror, 1965. She appeared nude in several of the movies she was cast in, and appeared in numerous gialli including So Sweet, So Dead, 1972 by Roberto Bianchi Montero, The Bloodsucker Leads the Dance by Alfredo Rizzo, and the more famous flick Strip Nude for Your Killer, 1975 by Andrea Bianchi. Other film credits of hers include Hawks and Sparrows, 1966 by Pierre Paolo Pasolini. She retired from acting in the early 1980s. Virgilio Gazzolo appears in Don't Torture a Duckling, 1972. Ivo Garani was in Hercules, 1958 by Pietro Francisi. Black Sunday, 1960 by Mario Bava. Waterloo, 1970 by Sergei Bondarchuk. And Caliber 9, 1972 by Fernando de Leo. Ernesto Colli made many uncredited appearances, but is credited in La Califa, 1970 by Alberto Bevilacqua, as well as Caliber 9, 1972. And eventually, his typecasting saw him usually playing the red herring in later gialli such as Kill the Poker Player, 1972, Torso, 1973 by Sergio Martino, and Autopsy, 1975. He passed away in 1982 at the age of 42. And that is part one of the Forgotten Giallo films of 1968. I hope you learned something new here. If you are interested in watching these movies, look them up online. If you do watch them or have already seen them, I invite you to leave your thoughts on them in the comments. Follow The King in Giallo on Instagram and give a like to The King in Giallo on Facebook. Subscribe here on YouTube if you aren't already and join me every week for new Giallo film content. If you have any questions, thoughts, curiosities, or concerns, Concerns, leave those below in the comments section and I will get back to you. Upcoming content on The King in Giallo will be the overview, review, and gialli tally for Giulio Chesti's 1968 Proto Giallo Death Laid an Egg. Thank you very much for your continued support. This is Tanner Leeser for The King in Giallo, and if nothing else, I'll see you next time. Liar. He said, where is he? Out with it! I don't know! You don't know where your own boyfriend I is? I don't see him anymore! All right, you bitch.